Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of the Living and Fullness Podcast. Today I'm excited to introduce our guest, Sheila Afari. You are in for a treat. Welcome to the Living and Fullness Podcast where you will get relatable, authentic, entertaining and thought-provoking content. I am your host, Naki Muteto. Here, we believe everyone has a story and every story has a purpose. It's when you own your story, your voice, and your journey that it's able to impact those around you. Our journeys and life experiences are not a coincidence. Join us on our journey to living their purpose on purpose by staying glued to learn more from real life experiences. <laughs> so Sheila is a um, well-recognized person in society. She's worked with various brands and she's felt um, brands for different personalities out there. So Sheila, I don't want to mess up your file. So please <laughs> tell us who you are quickly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, first and foremost, an entrepreneur. I think I'd really identify as an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter, you know, what I'm doing. Mm. I am, well, my bio would say I'm a multi-award winning entrepreneur yeah. and media PR specialist. Mm -hmm. I am Ghanaian of origin, grew up in South Africa. Yeah, and she is a dynamic entrepreneur. There's a lot that she's doing. But one thing that I love that you say is you are, you have a passion for Africa, right? And you have a passion for showcasing its brand and talent, right? So I love that. And sometimes I think I just feel, that's why I get bothered when I see that people are, Africans are recognized internationally before they're recognized in Africa, right? I don't know if it's just my perception or if you notice it as well. Well, I think it's just maybe just the human psyche. It's where there's supposedly bigger markets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want that nod or that recognition. Yeah. I think just growing up, a lot of the media we consumed, mm -hmm. you know, was from the West. You know, if you look at the music industry, a lot of the big music awards, mm -hmm. you know, are based in, you know, the US or the UK. So I think just, you know, those accolades that people get, you know, do carry some gravitas that people want. Yeah. I think the problem probably comes when people feel like, they didn't get any recognition at home mm. and recognition started coming after you know mm -hmm. other people you know bestowed them on you know the accolades mm. and stuff but yeah i think you know we definitely need to cherish our own and appreciate mm -hmm. you know all things african um i think this is a mindset shift mm. i don't think there's anything wrong with you know global recognition but hopefully you know as time goes on we can just appreciate you know homegrown talent more why do you think, because I think speaking for myself, right, generally if I do get recognized by an international brand and I get more excited than when I'm recognized by an African brand, do you think it's more of um, the exposure that it gives me or where it puts me on the map or is it the money that it comes with? Well, maybe it's also a perception that, you know, mm -hmm. international recognition or international brands come with more money. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, I can't answer that for you. you know, if, you're getting, if you're getting a bigger bag, you know, it doesn't matter where it comes from, I'm sure you'll be excited. But I think that's definitely something that, you know, I hope as Africans we can change to be mm. like, you know, you would be just as excited, if, no, if not more excited, to be able mm. to collaborate with local um, brands or brands from the continent. I think everybody's always looking for, you know, what's bigger. Mm. But I think there's always trade-offs, <laughs> different yeah. trade-offs. I don't know if I'd... Well, yeah, I'm sure some people would be, you know, excited if something that's international, but... I think any kind of collaborations, you know, do bring some form of excitement or should bring excitement to people. Have you always wanted to be in PR? No. Um, honestly, I didn't even really know what PR was when I started. <laughs> I studied medicine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then didn't finish medicine, moved into psychology. So my undergrad and postgrad qualification is in psychology. Um, PR came pretty much by fluke. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to be helping a fashion designer with some stuff and I managed to get it featured in some, you know, fashion publications and she was looking for assistance with some stuff and I was like, hey, I can offer you some PR services. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look back and it's probably quite a crazy bold move because, mm -hmm. you know, I had no PR experience, really no PR 
had no contacts in the industry, but I just mm-hmm. genuinely believed that there's something I could do. Mm-hmm. And that's how PR company started, like just, you know, she needed services. I'd helped her, I'd managed to be able to get her a few coverage of magazines and her publicist at the time, I think, mm-hmm. you know, didn't really do anything for her. So I was confident that, you know what, I think I can do something, yeah. And you've always been an entrepreneur, right? Yes, I started my first business whilst at Varsity. I was walking on campus one day and I stepped on a flyer and I picked up the flyer and it was advertising and entrepreneurship week. And for some reason, that just piqued my interest. Um, I'd never really thought about being an entrepreneur before. Mm -hmm. I'd say the closest thing would be, you know, oh, one day when I have money, maybe I'll open up a store or something, you know, but not to like start something from ground up. And during that week, I was just blown away. You know, there were so many students that were running their own businesses. Mm -hmm. Some were paying their own university fees. Some were paying their siblings' university fees. And it was quite inspiring. And I believed that if other students could do it, so could I. Yeah. Um, Although I didn't really have any intention that I'll start a business (laughs) right then. But I just thought, you know what, I could also do this. And during that week, we learned how to register a business. Mm -hmm. So... I registered an events company um, based on one of the speakers who had Mm -hmm. said the way the economy is today, you can't just open up shop and think someone would patronize your business. So, you know, rather start a business using your two hands and feet from a hobby, something Mm -hmm. like that. And with the organizations that I was involved in at the time, there was a lot of kind of like event organizing component to it. So even though I didn't want to start a events company because I knew quite a lot of students that were kind of in that space. I was like, oh, I don't need another person starting an events company. But, you know, nonetheless, I registered an events company. Mm-hmm. Then in the week, they had a, like a dinner with some established entrepreneurs who network with us. Mm-hmm. And the man sitting next to me asked me, what do I do? So I told him I have an events company. Oh. <laughs> Literally, I registered it like two days before that. <laughs> and you have it. <laughs> and he told me, you know, he has an event coming yeah. up, do I want to organize it? Oh, wow. And I said yes, because I did recognize that he was, mm-hmm. he knew I was a student, he was just trying to give me an opportunity. Oh, okay. And I recognized he was giving me an opportunity and I took it. Mm. So my first event was for this multimillionaire at his penthouse in Seapoint in Cape Town. It wasn't a disaster, like it went well, <laughs> okay. but looking back, just the caliber of what I was doing, <laughs> it was quite... When you look in high It's really like, you know, I was a student, <laughs> Yeah. but you know, he was really great and he gave me a few more events after that. Um, then I ended up doing like Spain's 21st birthday parties, mm-hmm. then I moved to like race formals, then eventually started doing weddings and just kind of yeah. like there. So you have done weddings? Yes. What haven't you done? You know, I actually feel like before we go further, right? <laughs> I need you to tell me two truths and one lie about yourself and I'll have to guess the lie. <laughs> it's like you've done a lot of things. <laughs> two truths and a lie? Uh-huh. It's a broad though. Like in what context? Like work, personal life? Work. I have a US office for my PR company. Okay. I've won best brand for my PR company. I have clients from all over the world. <laughs> and that's probably a lie. Because I think you do have an office in the US, no? <laughs> you said you're always there, don't you? Yes, I'm always there, but I don't have an office yet. Oh, wow. So that's okay. what is the lie. So you do have clients <laughs> all over the world. I do. Dealing with successful people, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> that's nice. So, you know, when you were talking about your events company, you mentioned that you initially didn't want to get into it because you felt a lot of people were doing it, right? Do you feel, from your experience now, do you feel that um, for whatever you want to get into with entrepreneurship, if a lot of people have done it, it will hinder your success? No. I think when I was like, I don't want to start an events company because other people mm-hmm. doing it, it was more like, oh, it's boring. Like, mm-hmm. can't I be creative? Can't I come up with something else? Like, don't have any other hobbies? <laughs> can't I be different? Yeah. Um, but not because of market share. Okay. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, when that that question comes up or when people think about it in terms of is everyone doing it it's almost like there's a scarcity mentality to be like mm. okay there's a pie and it's like there's only 12 pieces in this pie and yeah. you can really see you know there's 12 people out there so mm-hmm. you know now and if you're going to get in yeah. you need to steal someone else's piece 
in my context of PR, like mm -hmm. I can't service the whole world. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I, I cannot true. service the whole world. So yeah. if there's another million publicists out there, like it can't really affect my pie or mm. my piece of the pie. Um, I think there's, you know, there's space for everybody. Mm. I don't think there's a thing of, you know, markets are saturated. Mm -hmm. If anything, if there's, you know, a demand for something, you know, it just means that there's more clients that need to be serviced. Mm. So, no, I don't think that that hinders success. Okay. So, you know what, when I think of my eight to five job, but so generally, I can't think of entrepreneurship without my eight to five job. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I don't know what everyone else thinks, right? I use my eight to five job as a safety net, mm -hmm. right? That if my hassles fail, if this other side jobs fail, at least I still get my salary, right? But I think if you do that, you don't have the hunger for your hassle. Like you don't really have that hunger to say, this is what, what feeds me. This is what gives me money. This is what feeds my family. So I need to do more, you know? But how then do you just start? How do you, because you've always been an entrepreneur, but um, what's your advice on someone who wants to leave their eight to five and say, you know, I just want to start? Yeah, well, no, don't just wake up and think you're going to quit your job. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's the smart thing to stay in your eight to five. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the day, if someone's going to be successful, mm -hmm. that needs to be self-driven. Yeah. You know what I mean? So whether there's a cushy bed, you know, underneath you or there's stones mm. or there's fire if you're gonna be motivated you're gonna be motivated mm. so the idea that you know if there's a cushion you might not be uh, motivated mm. then entrepreneurship is not for you because you know the person who's motivated to be like okay cool eight to five that's mm. done then it's like okay i'm burning the midnight oil now on my side ha side hustle yeah my weekends are now you know pushing my side hustle mm. and you want to get the point where your side hustle covers your main income and yeah. surpasses that yes so i know lots of people who went corporate mm -hmm. and you know eventually were able to quit their jobs and move mm. to full-time entrepreneurship and i think you know i don't know what's called experts or people recommend that you won't be able to have you know at least six months of your salary mm. saved up or projected that you yeah. would get that before saying okay you completely you know letting go of that safety net yeah i definitely was fortunate in the sense of when i started i had no responsibilities no liabilities nothing mm. so any little money i had i could put it into my business yeah so yes i definitely think it is more challenging if you all now have you know bonds and cars yeah. and kids and all of that um but i think this means you know push a little harder to be like outside of you know the eight to five mm -hmm. you know what are you doing to invest in you know the yeah. side hustle to be able to make the side hustle become the full-time job so you also believe in multiple streams of income right yes i think it's definitely necessary mm -hmm. um but i think it needs to be approached from a practical perspective mm. so you know if you have a nine to five you know, I think everyone needs to be able to respect the work and the space that they're in. Mm. So, you know, you don't use someone else's time to work on your stuff. You mm. know, like if someone is, you know, committing to giving you X amount of money monthly and you're committing to be present and do work, then be present and do work. Mm. You know, doing shortcuts, you know, working on your own thing during someone else's time. In the day, you might be thinking, you know, you're putting yourself first and you'll mm. succeed. You won't. Mm. You know, you don't want to be able to, you know, leave workspaces with bad blood or not having given your best because mm -hmm. you never know how, you know, you come back and interact with people, you know, your past employer might be a future client of yours, yeah. connections and things like that. So, yeah, that's true. So, you know, the other thing which we spoke off camera already, but I always say that um, with products, it's easier, right? So, for example, if I'm selling a product, people don't know me. They don't know my personality. I don't even know who is behind the products I use for my face or for my skin or whatever. But then with service, it's more like if people don't like you, then they won't like the content you put out there or the service that you offer just because they don't like your personality. So yeah. did you have any issue having to come into the market space and introducing yourself to people? And what are some of the strategies that you used to make sure that people trust you as a brand as well? that conversation or that analogy is quite layered mm. so on the simple basis of there's a product and a service mm. 
if it's a product that you know is established for no and want it mm -hmm. then yes definitely i think you know running a service business is harder it's like you know if you are the taxi rank mm -hmm. and you know you need tomatoes and someone there close to you has tomatoes and you know they don't smile at you they give me attitude <laughs> You still need those tomatoes, you buy yeah. it, you go. In the service space, it's completely different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if a client feels you're not giving them attention or mm -hmm. you're not servicing them well, or, you know, you're not replying their messages, you know, mm -hmm. that's not good. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, you're not going to be able to just kind of have that offhand approach. Mm -hmm. um, but on the flip side, if you're talking about now building a new product from scratch, mm -hmm. I think it's probably harder to do that, to get people to buy into, you know, why must I? leave another product that i'm using already to now use yours it. and build that base so when it's an established brand i think mm -hmm. there's a lot of hard work that goes to be able to get that kind of like industry you know approval reputation all those kind of things mm -hmm. i think on the service level you're able to kind of you know give you almost mm -hmm. like you can control certain things mm -hmm. but you can't control that you know you've now got a, a deal to be like okay we've got a retailer we've put us yeah. there and now will people buy, you know. What are some of the strategies that you've put in place to make sure that, you know, um, you're still able to maintain? Because it's one thing to get clients, right? Yes. But it's another thing to keep them coming. My philosophy is always under promise over deliver. Mm. So I think too many people over promise and under deliver, you That's know what I mean? <laughs> so it's yeah. almost like even if what you did was good and good enough, because you promised more and didn't deliver, you almost just, you know, oh, we're not going this person. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm always like, I tell people I don't guarantee you anything, you know? So literally, <laughs> even my under, my under promising is like bottom barrel. And yet they still work with you after that. Don't you yes. think people, um, what you call it, don't you think people over set those expectations so high just so that they can get people to work with them? Well, you have to be confident in yourself. Yeah. So I, I don't know if just being an entrepreneur, like I do have confidence that I can get things done. Yeah. But you have to work in a framework of, you know, what's ethical, what's practical. Mm -hmm. So in the media space, if I'm confident, I can actually get you interviews. Mm -hmm. But I'm not paying anybody for these interviews. So someone can actually say no. Mm -hmm. So even though my probability of I can get them to say yes is high, the fact that they can say no doesn't give me any room to tell you I can guarantee you that I'm getting you that platform. So I'm not going to blur the lines and, mm. you know, be like, okay, promise you this and this and this. Um, so I'll just keep it, you know, straight, clean, yeah. you know. <laughs> so you like ethical. manage expectations. Yes. Um, but a lot of work goes into it. Mm. So even if it's just, you know, like under promising over deliver, but it's just like the consistency of stuff. So, you know, I've worked really hard. You know what I mean? It's just like you're working late nights, early mornings, yeah. weekends, you put in the work. Yeah. And I think, you know, just being an entrepreneur, like I've loved that journey. So I think it's probably difficult if you're not enjoying what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it never really feels like work. So yes. even though I know that I'm putting in the time and the yeah. effort and the energy, I haven't like resented that, oh, mm. why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? That's good. Um, so definitely a lot of work went into kind of just building a good reputation and mm -hmm. building a good track record um, to the point now my business, you know, literally survives because of word of mouth and referrals. So I'm in a, I guess, a privileged position where, you know, a bulk of my clientele come to me versus me trying to go out and find these clients. Mm -hmm. But a lot of hard work, you know, did go into that. Okay. And, you know, I do have clients who will be like, oh, I use this other PR company within yeah. three months and we didn't even get one interview. I'm thinking, how is it possible to not even get one interview? Like, you didn't even try yeah. it. But I think people's frustrations really come when, you know, expectations aren't met. Mm -hmm. So people have promised the world, I promise you this, I promise you that. And for me, rather keep your money, you know. And there are clients who will be like, why is your contract say you, guarantee us, yeah. you don't guarantee us anything? I'm like, I'm not changing the clause in my contract, mm -hmm. you know, because... People who want quick wins, people who don't want things that are organic and are done in a certain way, they're not the right fit for me anyways. Mm, so, true. you know, I like people who want to go the journey of building their brand, aren't just trying to cut short corners, yes, quick wins. So it's also like a good filter to be like, you mm -hmm. know, the clients that I don't want, that usually just, you know, filters them out. 
Yeah, so you seem to me like a very intentional person. Like you know what you want to do, like you're saying now. So how do you choose which brands to work with? And for those you don't want to work with, how do you politely decline? Well, I think in the field of PR, and you know, I pride myself in someone you know who can get the job done. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to turn you away. Like we can get the job done. Doesn't matter who you are, what you're mm -hmm. doing. So it's usually kind of, I guess, a character alignment. Okay. So usually where we filter is people who are wanting, you know, certain things that don't, that aren't practical. Okay. You know, or just wanting things quick. You know, wanting, you know, don't want to sign because. You know, we don't guarantee them this, or you know, the one has to promise them this. Mm. Just rather keep your money. <laughs> or they're not ready to put in the work, but they want results. Do you also meet such people? Well, yeah, but I think because PR is only one aspect of mm -hmm. the ecosystem what builds a brand or an artist, mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone isn't willing to put in the work, it doesn't really affect what we're doing in terms of what we've been engaged there. I think okay. it would be more of a challenge for management to be like long term, mm -hmm. you know, ways of sustainability with this person, mm -hmm. or if it's a brand, you know, maybe you have one range out and then the designer doesn't do more. So I think on other levels, you know, if you're not going to put in the work, it hinders you. But if you come to us with one song, we can make one song work. Yeah. But, you know, for your creative directory, you eventually need an album, you know, but that becomes someone else's problem. So it's whether it's a label mm. or, you know, if you're running independent, you can't really go so far with one song. Mm. So um, what, uh, because I know one of your objectives, right, is to shift the mindset that African brands are inferior to international brands, right? Was that from your, um, is that something you noticed that, um, probably is it international or African brands do feel inferior and as African brands are we at a place where we're able to I don't want to for lack of a better word are we at a place where we're able to compete with the international brands or are we still trying to catch up can we compete to catch up I think you know I think everyone's looking to the African continent for stuff mm. but I think also just you know it's been 10 years in PR and even before that just kind of noticing you know how things have worked globally i think mm. we're definitely in a space now and today where it's just like africa your time is now like i mm. think that slogan couldn't be more relevant um yeah. so i think you know if you're african you know i think just all eyes are on you everybody wants you know to be mm -hmm. to be associated with you do stuff with you now's a good time in terms of just you know wanting to play a part in shifting that narrative it's about mm. saying African brands, African people are amazing and great and being unapologetic about it. Mm. So maybe in spaces where you'd be like, well, they wouldn't typically put an African person that cover. No, we're going to pitch that, you know, we're going to, you know, prove and show why, you know, this mm. African, you know, brand or talent deserves this cover piece. Mm. Oh no, we you just give you a quarter page. No, mm -hmm. we want a full page, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. it's about saying that, you know, if you're looking at why must on an African platform, an international person get um more exposure than yeah. a local person you know like or what's the difference yes mm. and i think for me you know that plays more of a role in the magazines that i'm building versus kind of like the pr space to be like you know as you know african people and black people it's about mm. we need to own our own narratives mm. and we need to be unapologetic about it um so certain platforms it's like we're featuring black people mm. you know what i mean it's just like yeah. you know there's lots of platforms that are predominantly you know white facing mm. and the scopes of you know where black people can fit in you know it's very limited mm. so it's about saying we're creating platforms and creating platforms for our own it's mm. not to say that we won't you know certain platforms it's not that we won't feature white people yeah. but it's about saying you know we're taking a stance to be like we're, we're pushing also, black yeah. content you know mm. five five black four black <laughs> yeah yeah so do you think there's a lot of people out there or a lot of talent out there that has not been recognized or that goes unnoticed. I'm saying this because there are times where I've seen, um, let's say on social media, I have seen people post such authentic um, content, right? But then for some reason, they just don't get views or likes or comments or any of that. So do you think it's how they position themselves or is it just not their time? <laughs> Well, it's like if you live in a world with how many billion people, like mm -hmm. you can't have your 
I and everybody, not everyone can get, you know, the same kind of space mm-hmm. or shine. Mm-hmm. So it's how do you stand out, you know, from everybody. Mm. So for me, talent is a bonus. You can be super talented if you're just making music in your bedroom or you're just drawing your bedroom and no one sees that. Mm. What good is that? You know what I mean? Mm. Someone who's less talented who's like, okay, I'm going to be doing interviews okay. about who know who I mm. am. I'm going to, you know, draw a painting of a famous person and tag them and try to meet them. And so you need to put yourself out. You know, mm. we, you can't expect that people are now like, knocking on people's doors and their bedrooms and be like yeah. hey Tabo, you 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 what can you do are you talented let's see yeah, you know what yeah, i mean like yeah. that's not feasible mm. so the person who takes the time to set up you know their own you know show and put it on youtube and have invested on cameras and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. you get to point where it's like you know how does investment work you know how do i get my audience i'm spending money boosting so more people can see it mm. um am i you know bringing high profile guests so that they can be tagged and reposed mm. you know am i engaging in pr thing at press release? what are you doing to now you know to get recognized and exposed exactly mm. i think i want to know how do you deal with failure because i think everyone fails right as much as we we all do well but i think there's lessons in failure as well so how do you deal with um even maybe i can call them blockers you know like you just get that blockage to the purpose that you're trying to achieve how do you deal with failing or not really getting to where you want to get to what is failure exactly what like is success? yeah yeah like <laughs> what is failure is it like you know you read a maths um, test then because you got a score below 50. So like maybe, you know what i mean so i think it's just uh-huh. one of those things where it's just like Every lesson, every experience, mm. you know, contributes to something, mm. you know. So I think failure is giving up because then it's done. You know what I mean? Mm. So failure isn't, oh, you've lost money. Failure isn't, you know, like mm. you lost a client, mm. your design, the seam started falling off. Mm. Those are opportunities for you to learn and be better. Mm. And sometimes, you know, I believe the the best lessons are the most expensive ones. So I don't think, you know, um, I'm not scared of failing. Mm. You know, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I just believe that I'm quite self-driven and self-motivated. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't see myself in a space where I'm just like, I'm just going to, you know, pack up and call it a day. Mm. You know, sometimes in the journey, you know, things are tough and you just ask yourself like, why do I work so hard? Like, what is this for? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, next thing I know, I'm creating another business. Like, mm. I'm just in that space where, you know, things excite me and I want to do stuff. And I just believe without a doubt that, you know, I'll be successful. Mm. So it's like, whatever happens along the way, it's like, okay, this is happening now, but, you know, the future, bigger picture, I believe that there's something there and something great that's coming. Mm. Um, you know, so whatever speed bumps or hurdles that happen along the way, I think mm. biggest ways to be able to um, you know, contribute to the overall journey and, you know, the success and things that happen. Mm. Can't remember where I read it, but, or who said it, mm-hmm. but they're basically saying, you know, everyone's life is like a pack of cards. Mm-hmm. So you know that there are four aces in, the, in that pack. Yeah. You know, so you've got wins there. You know, mm-hmm. so you just have to believe that, you know, in your life, whatever you want, whatever you want to achieve, you'll get it. Mm. So sometimes if you went through 20 cards and you're like, oh my gosh, it's been 20 cards yeah. and I'm tired, I give up. Mm. You don't know the 21st card is going to be the ace, you know, the 40th one. So it's about also just knowing, you know, do you have the staying power, the manpower to go through the journey and just believe that, you know, there's a win that comes out of this. Mm. Maybe you got all your aces in the beginning and it's like, cool. Yeah. Um, so I just, you know, innately believe that, you know, um, I'll live a successful life. And our journeys are different. So how do you define success? Exactly. I think that's a good question. I think very personal. <laughs> right? Yeah. It is. So some people might have like a monetary value linked to that success. You know, other people, you know, for me, it's just living a comfortable life. Yeah. And comfortable life also is also subjective. <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's, it's contentment. But, Don't you think? Like, if well, you're content I think... with where you're at in every season because every season is different yes but for me i wouldn't define 
contentment and success. Like mm. I'm content with the life I have, but, but it doesn't mean you, you you've reached success yet. I can acknowledge that I'm successful, but I don't necessarily think that you know I'm necessarily a successful person. You're where you want to be. Yeah, but okay. um, I think I'm definitely in a great space now, just mm -hmm. in terms of you know I've been doing business for quite a while. Almost like the teething process is like I'm over that process, yeah. but you know as entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter what stage you are, you always still get challenges. But you learn to just you know handle things better so i just feel like i'm i'm a lot less stressed now than a few years ago yeah um i go with the motto if if it isn't something that's in my control yeah. let it go you know so if someone owes you money you've sent your invoices you send your reminders at least what you can do you can't now be stressing you know yeah you let it go rather find solutions okay cool if i needed this money how do i you know mm -hmm. make money elsewhere or whatever find solutions but it was out of your control, don't stress about it. No point yeah. stressing about things that are out of your control. But I think for me, just I'm building a life that will allow me to earn money and not work. Oh, yeah, that's the dream. So <laughs> I need to be able to build the business to a point where it's it completely self-sufficient. Mm. I think just, you know, I have realized over the years that my business has my DNA. Yeah. So I would never completely, you know, be removed from it mm. but i'm slowly getting there where you know things are running without me kind of having to be a part of everything mm. and you know the aim is that you know you have a family you spend time be able to raise kids be able to do things mm. without that you know pressure of you know i need to be working to earn so for me success is kind of like when you have like passive income yeah <laughs> and i think what keeps you i think the reason i mentioned contentment right is what keeps you going is you being content because i think people give up social media i think has a way of making people feel as though they're not doing as much as everyone else is doing so when you're not okay with where you're at don't you don't you think sometimes people end up giving up or giving up their dreams or wherever they see themselves because they think Maybe this is not for me just because they've failed at it. Well, I think it involves a lot of introspection. Like, I think people would answer the, that question, you know, quite differently. Yeah. I think some people feel like if they were content with where they're at, to slow them down, they wouldn't be hungry anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so true. I think different that's people true. would approach that differently. Depends with the personality. Yeah, I know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you everybody for watching. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. I hope you've learned a lot because I have. See you next time. Please let us know who else you want to bring here because we obviously have people that you have to learn a lot from. Thanks for watching.